Today we're going to look at two pretty nice but fairly different problems from the math magazine. So let's jump right into the first one. So let's define this finite sequence of 101 numbers, which we'll name A0, A1, up to A100, by the following expansion of a polynomial. So we have 1 plus x plus x squared to the 50th power will be equal to a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared all the way up to a100 times x to the 100. It's pretty clearly a degree 100 polynomial. And then our goal is to show that the sum of the even indexed numbers is odd. Okay, so we're going to maybe present a pretty quick way to do this, but then I want to sketch a more direct way, but then maybe not go all the way in that sketching. And I'll like maybe open it as a question if you guys can finish this off. Okay, so let's perhaps start by setting x equal to 1 and see what we get. Now you might say, well, setting x equal to 1 won't help us. That gives us the sum of all of the numbers over here, but it's at least a good start. So setting x equal to 1, notice that the right-hand side, like I said before, will be the sum of all of the numbers. So we've got a0 plus a1 plus a2 plus a3 ending at a100. But then over there on the left-hand side, we have 1 plus 1 plus 1 to the 50th. In other words, we have 3 to the 50th power. And now, what are we going to do from here? Well, now we'll set x equal to minus 1. And this has the effect of building an alternating sum. But that's actually the trick here. If we've got an alternating sum, then we can add these two objects and only have the even terms. We could also subtract them and only have the odd terms if we wanted. Okay, so let's see how this goes. So notice we'll have a0 minus a1 plus a2 minus a3 all the way up minus a99 plus a100 is equal to, well, we've got 1 minus 1 plus minus 1 squared, so all of that in there becomes 1 to the 50th, which is 1. Okay, great. But now, like I said, we will add these and observe that all of the odd terms cancel. So let's see, we'll in fact have 2 times a0 plus a2 ending with a98 and a100 is equal to 3 to the 50 plus 1. And now, well, observe that that 3 to the 50 plus 1 is most definitely even, because 3 to the 50 is odd. You add 1 to it and you get something that's even. So we can divide it by 2 and we'll have a whole number, which clearly we should be able to do that. We just want to make sure that we get an odd number when dividing by 2. That could be a multiple of 4, in which case we would get an even number when dividing by 2. Now, there's a number of ways to do this. I want to do this the way without really knowing anything about modular arithmetic. So let's take this 3 to the 50 plus 1 and write it as 2 plus 1 to the 50th power plus 1. And now I want to expand that 2 plus 1 to the 50th power using like a binomial expansion rule. So that's going to give me 2 to the 50 plus 50 times 2 to the 49 plus, well, the next one would be 50 choose 2 times 2 to the 48 all the way down. Let's see, the next to last one will be 50 times 2 to the first power, and then we'll have plus 1 to the 50th power, and then plus another 1 as well from the one that comes out from the thing on the right there. Okay, cool. But the really important thing to notice here is this thing that I'm overlining in this magenta color is pretty clearly a multiple of 4. That's because up until the very end, we get, well, we get an even power of 2, which is clearly a multiple of 4, but then that last coefficient is 50, which is a multiple of 2. So 50 times 2 will be a multiple of 4. Well, it's 100. We know that's a multiple of 4. So that means we can factor a 4 out of this, 
And after factoring a four out of this, we'll be left with a bunch of other stuff. I'm just gonna call all of that stuff in. And then I'll smoosh these two ones together to four n plus two. But now, well, essentially we're home free. We can divide both sides by two and we'll have a zero plus a two plus all the way up to a 100 is equal to two n plus one, which is pretty clearly odd. So now what's maybe what I said before would be the direct way to do this, which is probably quite a bit harder, but might be worth playing around with. Well, I think you could do something like this. You could take this one plus x plus x squared to the 50th and perhaps view it as one plus x times one plus x, all raised to the 50th. And then expand that thinking of it as a binomial where we have one as one of the terms and then x times one plus x is the other term. So let's see, that's gonna expand as the sum as k goes from zero up to 50 of 50 choose k times x to the k times one plus x to the k. And then, I don't know, maybe you would expand out the one plus x to the k as well, and then like group all of the things together in a way that it's obvious that all of these even powered terms sum to something odd. Like I said, this is probably quite a bit harder, but it would also provide a lot of practice with messing around with binomial coefficients and the such, which is always like good practice if you haven't done that kind of thing before. Okay. So anyway, we did achieve our goal over here. So let's maybe call this problem done and move on to the next one. Okay, so for our next problem, we've got an integral. So let's see the setup here. Let's suppose that f is a continuous function on the positive real numbers, and it satisfies the condition where f of one over x equals minus f of x. And then what we wanna do is take a to be another positive real number and evaluate the following integral. We've got the integral from root two minus one to root two plus one of one over x squared plus one times one plus a to the power f of x. So perhaps the value of this integral should depend on a or could perhaps depend on a. So let's maybe jump into this. You know that there's gonna be a trick because the fact that we've got a function in the exponent there means that this could be really complicated if there wasn't a trick, and in fact there is. So we're gonna start by taking one half of the integral added to itself. So let's see, root two minus one times root two plus one, and we have this dx over x squared plus one times one plus a to the f of x, so that's my first copy. And then for my second copy, what I'll do is take root two minus one to root two plus one, and then I'll say dt over t squared plus one times one plus a to the f of t. So really I just changed the dummy variable for that. And I'll do that because I'm about to make a substitution. And I think the substitution is pretty obvious. We'll take t and set it equal to one over x in that second integral. And why do I say that I think that's pretty obvious? Well, that's because we want to somehow use this fact right here. But notice if t is one over x, then x is one over t. And then, well, let's see, we know that dt is equal to minus dx over x squared. That's pretty clear. And then let's also observe that one over the square root of two plus one is equal to the square root of two minus one. In other words, those two numbers right there that are the bounds of integration are in fact reciprocals of each other. So uh, that's cool. Let's see what we get out of this. So we're gonna have a one half and then we've got our integral root two minus one to root two plus one. We have our dx over x squared plus one, one plus a to the f of x. Okay, good. And then let's see. From that, we need to add the integral after the substitution that we've just made. So let's see, I'll bring this minus sign out front and then we'll have the integral from root two plus one to root two minus one because the 
bounds of integration will swap based off of this rule right here and our substitution. And then we'll have one over x squared plus one, and then one plus a to the f of one over x, that's occurring in the uh, exponent there. And then we'll have a dx here, and then times a one over x squared. Okay, cool. But now I'm gonna do a bit of simplification here, and maybe I'll do some simplification just by erasing and rewriting. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll swap the bounds of integration. And if I swap the bounds of integration, I can just change that minus to a plus. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do. The second is I'm going to take this 1 over x squared, or really the x squared in the denominator, and multiply it through right here. So if I do that, I'm going to end up with, let's see, this will turn into x squared plus 1 just based off of the simplification. And then the very last thing that I'll do is I'll take that f of 1 over x and use my rule over here. My rule to write this as minus f of x. Okay, great. But now observe that I can smush those two integrals together and factor a 1 over x squared plus 1 out. So let's see, I've got 1 half and then the integral from root 2 minus 1 to root 2 plus 1 of... Let's see, like I said, we're going to factor this 1 over x squared plus 1 out of the whole thing. And then we'll be left with 1 over, let's see, that's 1 plus a times, or to the power f of x. And then it'll be 1 over 1 plus a to the power minus f of x. But let's maybe multiply the numerator and the denominator by a to the f of x there. That gives me a common denominator. So that'll give me an a to the f of x in the numerator here and a 1 plus a to the f of x in the denominator. Okay, so again, that's just by kind of multiplying that second fraction by a to the f of x over a to the f of x. But check it out. Now we see that these two objects add together to the number 1. I think, well, I think that's pretty clear because you get the same numerator as you have the denominator. So that means in the end here, we have 1 half, and then this integral from root 2 minus 1 to root 2 plus 1 of dx over x squared plus 1. But in fact, we know the antiderivative for 1 over x squared plus 1. That's a standard antiderivative. It's the inverse tangent. So we have 1 half, and then the arctan of root 2 plus 1 minus the arctan of root 2 minus 1. Okay, cool. And then from here, maybe I'll leave it as a bit of a homework exercise to kind of take this to the end. But there's an angle sum formula for the tangent function that can be rewritten as a sum formula for the inverse tangent function, which will immediately show that the final answer here is pi over 8. So in fact, it's a half times pi over 4, but you know, that's going to be pi over 8. Now, maybe in this small margin that's left over down here, I want to like show a little nice application of this result. So let's think of a function that satisfies this functional equation. And I think the one that jumps out immediately is if f of x equals the natural log of x. So that definitely satisfies this functional equation. It's not the only thing that does. For instance, 1 minus x over 1 plus x also satisfies this functional equation. But if we take this, then we have a to the f of x is equal to, well, a to the natural log of x. But then we can write a as, let's see, e to the power natural log of a, but then I'm going to swap this to natural log of x raised to the natural log of a, which makes all of this equal to x to the natural log of a. But since the natural log function is on to, well, that means that that exponent can be really any real number. So this is equal to x to the r with r equal to natural log of a. But like I said, because natural log function is on to, r could be any real number. So that means we have the following result. So for all r real numbers, 
we have the integral from, I'll just put a dot down here for the starting point and the ending point, but it's that starting and ending point of dx over x squared plus one times one plus x to the r is always equal to pi over eight. And I think there are some other famous integrals that look like this, where that r takes on some crazy value. And well, the reason it's allowed to take on any crazy value you want is because no matter what that number is, you get pi over eight. But that being said, this result that we've just proven here can be seen kind of as a generalization of that. And that's a good place to stop.